So at this point, uh, we've added a picture. We've added at least one picture to the project. Before we add the other pictures, I want to stop at this point because notice the, the picture that I've added is nice and big and it's very uh, detailed. It's high quality and so forth. But the problem is that it's too big. It's too big for the image, uh, for, the, for the viewport, for the app. Uh, I want to use some CSS to maybe rein this in a little bit because right now that picture is not responsive. It doesn't change according to the size of the of the device. The nature of it is that it doesn't doesn't obey anything until we we uh, force it to do something. In our case, I want it to fit the size of the screen depending on the size of the screen. I want it to respond to that, and we're going to do that via CSS. So we've seen, uh, like on the first day, when we played with a little bit of CSS, that we can change the size of pictures with CSS. So that's what we'll do here. But instead of writing it in line, we're going to write it in our, in our CSS file. If you go back to your folder, remember you're working with the index file, which has the structure and content. And then we've got this Kodika Extra CSS file. Extra or external, whatever it stands for. The CSS file will then house it will house all of our CSS rules and properties uh, where we can apply it globally throughout our whole file or multiple files and this will be better than having inline CSS so go back to your file your index file first well we'll do it we'll do it this way go to your Kodika extra CSS file edit it in notepad plus plus I mean don't double click it it won't do what you want you want to right click and edit with notepad the kodika.ext.css file. So kodika.ext.css, right click, edit with notepad. Here it is in notepad. And it says put your custom code here. So I'm going to talk about the, the three most common types of CSS selectors that we can use. That's a keyword there, selectors, or you might also hear them as rules. Um, let me name them and then talk about them and then we'll, we'll use them. So what I'm going to write here is going to be non-standard for a moment, um, just so that it makes sense, and then we'll actually do it. But notice as a quick aside, we can add <coughs> comments also in CSS, but notice these are different than HTML. HTML comments are like this. HTML comment. But we do not write HTML comments in a CSS file. It's not HTML, it's CSS. Notice they did not turn green because it's not a comment. The comment in CSS looks like this, slash asterisk. Then you put your comments which can be multi-line. This is multi-line. And then it ends backwards, asterisk slash. So it does have a pair, and it's simply slash asterisk. And this is actually very common in many other languages, this kind of comment tag. It's also the kind that we'll use in JavaScript. But that line is a comment. Very important here, do not put a space between the slash and the asterisk. Look at that. Look at how it changed font and color and such. Now it thinks it's a command, in a sense. It's not. It's still a comment, I think, but we added. I added the space and I broke it. Make sure you've got no space there or there. So the, we have three types of selectors. So I'm going to write a comment here. You can write comments if you want. Uh, the three types of CSS selectors. With CSS, we are selecting parts of the document to edit or to manipulate somehow. CSS, as we've seen, allows us to change background color, text color, add drop shadows, add rounded corners, and other more advanced stuff like even animation. We can do animation with CSS. We need to first, however, select something in the project to edit. So there's three types, three basic types. Uh, this first one, 
is a tag selector, which is simply, for example, body. And the syntax is the name of the tag. Notice it's not in angle brackets. This is the body tag space curly brace, which is shift square brace, which is next to the P. So look on the keyboard on the P, you'll see a square brace and a curly brace. Curly brace is shift square brace. Enter a couple of times and then close the angle bracket. <coughs> so these two are tag CSS uh, selectors. These redefine the look of an existing tag. The body tag is defined and exists, it's reserved. H1 tag we've heard of. What other what are other tags we've heard of? P tag. So let's say we want a different kind of background color for paragraphs. So within the curly braces, we would then write background dash color pink. And then in theory, anywhere throughout my whole document, the index file where we've got a P tag, it will now get a pink background. I could do H1 color, which remember is text color, yellow. So I'm, I'm writing a tag selector. I'm saying wherever a P exists throughout our project, wherever an H1 exists, wherever a body tag exists, change it like this within the curly braces. Notice then I've got the, the semicolon at the end, and if I also wanted a background color, I could then do background dash color blue semicolon. If you run your if you run your project, be careful here. If you save and run the CSS file, you will get a screen full of code. You want to remember to run your index file. But anyway, I've made a couple of quick changes. These are not going to be permanent. I'm just showing you that I am redefining the look of an existing tag. And if I go look at my project, look at that. There's that blue background with yellow text on the H1, but it didn't seem to obey that pink color because CSS honestly is complicated. CSS is interrelated with a bunch of other rules or selectors. I'm a, I already have jQueryMobile.css. I've already got a file with like a hundred definitions, a hundred selectors that are saying do this and this and this and this. And so I'm trying to then apply my own style to something that might already exist, and therefore I've got a conflict which is being ignored. So I'm not seeing that pink background. Somewhere in my jQuery mobile CSS file, there is a definition that says the background of the main app is gray. And that's why my pink right here is not able to override it. Perhaps I'm not specific enough, or perhaps I'm not targeting or selecting the right tag. So these three that I wrote here are all tags. Next, I have a I have an ID. An ID is like a tag, sort of, that I invent. I can add an ID to anything in the HTML file. For example, so another comment here. Let's say I've got a p tag and it just says hello and p tag. But I only want a specific paragraph. Well, let me do it like this. Uh, another p tag and this one says goodbye. They're both p tags. My rule up here, my selector says every p tag, give it a pink background. 
but I only want really the pink background on hello. I don't want it on goodbye. I want a different color on goodbye. So this rule right here, the CSS selector, is way too broad. It's applying to every paragraph in my whole project. I only want it to apply to certain paragraphs. That's when then it might be useful to use an ID. And the way that works is on the P tag, within the P tag, I would write space ID equals um, yellow BG, for example. And in a moment I'll show you then, okay, now I can target that one paragraph. That one paragraph has a unique ID that the other one doesn't. Hello doesn't have that ID. So therefore, if I write a CSS selector to only target goodbye, I would do it like this. Uh, hash mark yellow bg and say background color orange. Question here? Is it uh, case sensitive? It is case sensitive. So if I wrote yellow bg in all lowercase right here and then I define it as yellow bg uppercase it won't work. So keep them consistent either all lowercase or if you do mix in cases keep it consistent. And I'm just showing you here that it's often common when there's more than one word that defines something like an ID. Uh, oftentimes uh, programmers then add capital letters between the words because it will not work to call this yellow space BG. That is completely different, which is a little complicated that I a little more complicated than I need to explain what that space is, but that space is very important. So if I keep it no spaces, that'll work. But then it's a little hard to read. So what's common is for programmers to then put capital letters to separate words. I could, this could have been yellow background. And then it would be common to put the capital B there just a little bit for readability for us humans to be able to read and understand the code. So I'll be obvious like that actually. So let's say in my index file I've got a couple of paragraphs and one of them does not have an ID and one of them does have an ID. So what's happening is that this first paragraph will be controlled by this top selector and give it a pink background. But then this second ID, uh, the second paragraph would be controlled by this selector that has this unique ID. And this might not quite be making full sense, but again, I'll be explaining it and we'll be doing it. But this is the second type of um, CSS selector. I'll also go back and make a note here. A tag redefines the properties of an existing tag. It has to exist in the HTML standard, not that I invented it. It has to exist in the standard. The body, HR, the A tag for a link, etc. I can create my own kinds of tags, and that would be an ID and the other one I'll mention in a moment. So if we look at so further here, an ID applies to an element that I name and is unique to the document. <coughs> what that means is can only be used once per document. And that sort of makes sense if you've been paying attention. We've got section data role equals page, ID equals home, section, data role page, ID equals art, uh, section, data role equals page, ID equals PC. We've been using this concept already. Each of the pages, each of the screens within our project has had a unique ID. 
and technically we would be able to control it via CSS. But the point is that if you use any ID, it can only be used once per document. Even though I might have seven screens, it's still one document. So I cannot reuse ID equals art more than once. I can only use it once. And then my rule here, my CSS selector, applies to one of them. So these. Can I recap what you just say? Um, once per document, if you have seven screens in your one document, that one ID tag can be used throughout all of those seven screens? No. Those seven screens are still existing in one document. So I can only use them, I can only use that ID once in the whole index.html document. I cannot reuse it in the different sections. Visually for us, it's oh, a different okay. screen, but the, the device, okay. the web browser, sees it as one document. So, so for each section, you have to make a new ID? Yes, okay. exactly. So you have to make a new ID for each section, or else you'll have the conflict. Now, sometimes, though, we do want to reuse this. I want to apply this orange background to more than one place in the document, but I'm limited here because I've got an ID. Notice, when I'm writing it in HTML, it says ID equals, and then the name of the ID, no pound symbol. That's just the way it is. But when I define it, I have to have a pound symbol. That's what differentiates that from a tag. Notice also the color of Notepad++. A tag is that sort of blue basic color, and then an ID is this sort of a sky blue color. And that's because it's an ID. The pound symbol marks it as an ID, and again, do not add a space there. Notice how that thinks now, okay, you were writing an ID with no name, and then a tag called yellow background, which does not exist in HTML. The third type of selector here, or CSS rule, is the is the um, is the class. Applies to an element that I name is not unique to the document. What that means is can be used multiple times per document. So whereas an ID can only be used once per document, a class is the opposite. It can be used a hundred times per document. So let's say I had some sample code here again. Well, well, this time we'll do it with uh, we'll do it with h tags. Let's say cat h two dog and then a paragraph. Because the, the p tag has been defined up at the top, it'll inherently be pink, at that point, pink background. And also because on the top here I've said for a heading 1, give that a blue background, yellow text, that'll also be applied. Um, but then let's say I want to override all of that. Um, so I can use classes and I'm going to say the heading 1 inside of the tag will say class equals new background and then the heading 2 also will say class new background and the heading 3 will say class new background and then when I define well what does new background mean I write it in my CSS file as dot new class new background The dot is what marks this as a 
CSS class. And then I can say color of my text, white, and then background color, black. And so for all three of those, they will all have then a black background and white text. So as I said earlier, it's not a good idea to add inline CSS. It's not a good idea to, to go here, P style equals black and white and h2 style equals black and white, and h1 style equals black and white. This almost seems like we did that because I had to manually go in and add class, class, class. But once you've added the class to those three things, later on I just go back to my one CSS selector and now say color yellow, background color brown. And then that will automatically get applied to those three or 30 that have the class attached. So this is why we want to include all, if uh, most, if not all, of our CSS selectors, our CSS rules, in a CSS file. Include them all in one place so that we can edit them easily in one place. And this is what, what we're going to do in the class and what is recommended for a, a modern, efficient web project. Any questions so far? This works because at the very top of my of my index file, line 15, there's a link to the style sheet Kodika external CSS. If that line were not there, then all of those rules would be ignored <coughs> because this file does not know to use that file. So this was written for us by Kodika, and it's a link to the local CSS file that we are writing our custom code at, our custom CSS code, CS, custom CSS rules. And notice the order it was written in the index file. First is another style sheet, the jQuery mobile style sheet. And then comes our style sheet. So what CSS stands for is cascading style sheets. It's a sheet in that it is a file, a .css file. It deals with editing the style of the project, the colors, the background. You can put a background image, the, the design of your bullet points, the alignment of your project, of your images, the style. And the cascading part means dealing with what is the what takes precedence, what takes over other rules. Because what if I've got two h1 definitions like this? What if I wrote h1 again and then I wrote here background color purple? Which of those two would win? They're both trying to do the same thing. CSS defines basically a cascade. What does a cascade do? It's a waterfall. What does it do? Falls from top to bottom. It goes down. So a cascade goes from top to bottom. CSS rules go from top to bottom, and it obeys them top to bottom, and then left to right. So this would, you know, this would be loaded in the web browser or in the device, and it would process everything. It would get to this point, make every heading one blue background. 
And then it would get to this one and say, actually, make them purple. Mm -hmm. So then they become purple. <coughs> and then that one gets overridden. So that's, in short, the cascade. Uh, what takes precedence? Well, what comes last? And we've seen this here. This p tag is saying, make, them back, make all paragraphs pink. So it does. But then later on, we say, actually, make this particular p tag uh, with a yellow background, or orange, and then um, this one, make it uh, brown, <clears throat> because again it comes later. <coughs> so that's the cascade part of it. CSS, three simple uh, letters, complex idea. And CSS was invented later than HTML. HTML was invented by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, 1989 or so, and then there were several years of the dark ages of web design until about 1998 or so, where a team, I believe in either Sweden or Norway, I think it was Norway, developed CSS in 98, the standard, so that now we can have nice looking or nicer looking websites with uh, this standard. And we, we currently usually come across either CSS 2, I believe it's at 2.2, or, as we're going to be looking at it in this class, CSS3. Version 2.2, I think it's maybe 2.1, and 3. So again, the three pillars. The HTML is the content and, the, and then the overall foundation. CSS is the design. And then JavaScript is the interactivity. <coughs> That's why also it, we don't want to write, we want to avoid, it's not that you, sometimes you need to do it, but you want to avoid it as much as possible, putting style equals background. It's another color, gold. We want to avoid putting inline style like that because that one takes the ultimate um, precedence. It's even closer to the metal. It's right at that element. Define it like this. And that is going to override all of these right here. So that's annoying because then I have to edit that one line out of my 500 lines of code, whereas the point of using a CSS file is that now this will apply equally to all my 500 lines. And if I make another change here, that automatically trickles down and applies everywhere to my document, except for the <coughs> one right here that has the most specificity. <coughs> That's why we want to avoid inline styles. They're great for a quick and dirty fix, but you might be causing yourself problems in the future. It's better to work with a CSS file. So it acts like a global, such that wherever mm -hmm. you get started, it overrules the existing global CSS. Well, the CSS file is the global one because we are saying up on line 15, apply this globally. Right. But then the specific one, that's the specific one. The inline. The inline is the specific one. And it overrides the global. Yes. So it will go through the whole uh, project and implement that inline specification. What was the first part that you said of that? Okay. The um, the inline overrides the global. <coughs> mm -hmm. So that it will also go through the whole project and implement. Oh no. The inline will only override this one example of H1. It will not apply to every example of the whole project. Just that one example. Any other questions? This is an important aspect, but again, it's a complicated one, as we'll see a little bit later, because I want to change the background color of my, of my, uh, my header and footer up here. And notice it only changed that piece of it. Well, what else is going on? As we go on further and use tools to sort of uh, 
figure out what we need to edit, then we will then be able to um, edit and control every aspect of this. But for the moment, um, I'm not going to worry about just yet that I can't quite do what I want. We still have a lot to learn, uh, but we will be able to customize the project exactly how you want as time goes on. So all of these tags that I'm writing here, actually, this was just kind of informational for the lecture. I'm not going to actually apply them to my project. So what I want to do, I don't want to delete the code here because I thought maybe it's useful. So what comments are also useful for is to deactivate code. A comment is great for me to make myself a note, what is this? But a comment is also great to turn off code turn off an HTML tag, turn off a CSS rule, turn off a JavaScript command. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out this code that I wrote here, which is currently active. So I'm going to start the comment tag right here and then end it right here. I am going to do it in groups because if you have a <coughs> comment inside of a comment, that might be problematic. So I've added the comment from to comment out all of the tag selectors. I ended it there. I had the comments that explained what an ID was. I'll leave that alone. And then I'll comment out that particular ID. It didn't really do anything, but I'll comment it out. I didn't really use it anywhere. Comment it out. And then also I'll comment out that one. I may use them yet later, but I don't want to remove them. You might notice I'm doing a little trick here. I'm indenting the code just so that I see that it's within this section. That's totally optional. doesn't matter. My trick here is, instead of going to every line, tab, 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 here's the trick. If you select all the lines, you know, you make a selection, and then tab, they all tab. So Notepad will tab all of those selections for you. This is pretty cool. You don't have to you don't have to select the whole line like this. If I select this line and just put it up to this point right here, notice I didn't select the whole word body. It's smart enough to know you mean the whole line, so it'll tab the whole line. Okay, so that was our discussion of some concepts of CSS. We'll talk about CSS more, of course. What I want to do before we take our next break is I want to write a CSS rule to kind of get this image under control. The image that I've added to the home screen here is way too big and it's not responsive. It doesn't grow and shrink to the size of my screen. So I'm going to write a CSS rule. Am I going to write a tag? True or false? True. I could write a tag that says image and then define a width. But image will apply to every image in the whole project and I don't need every image to be a certain size. So tag wouldn't quite work. Would ID work? Yes, ID would work. But what's the limitation of ID? It'll only work on that one picture. And I want to apply the rule to the picture that I'm going to have on the home screen, the art screen, and the computer screen. So then what's the logical choice? Class. We're going to create a class to apply it to multiple images throughout my project so that they all obey this, these rules that I'm about to write. So at the end of the document, we'll start dot, and we'll make up a, we'll make up a, a, a name here. Let me call it wide image, IMG. Any name will work. Uppercase, lowercase, does matter. 
do not add a space there. That is something totally different that I won't get into just yet. I've got it run together as one word, but I've got what is known as camel caps or intercaps. Camel caps are just that you've got a capital letter or two inside of a word, like humps, in a, humps on a camel, camel caps or intercaps. So make sure you've got the dot, you've got the name, space, curly brace, couple of enters, close curly brace. What I want to do then is say with colon, for the moment we'll say 50% semicolon. I'm saying I want that picture to be 50% the size of my screen. I want that picture to be 50% of this viewport. This is half of what I need to do. I've defined the rule. I've written the selector and its property and attribute. Its attri I mean its attribute and value. Selector, attribute, <coughs> value. Uh, I've written it, but I have not attached it to that picture. It doesn't know to apply this to that picture or my other 40 pictures. So let's make sure we wrote this. That's part one. Write the rule. And then we will attach it to the element. We need to switch over to the index file. Over on line 58, we need to say, hey, this image, pay attention to that rule. So anywhere inside of the tag, I'll add it after the alt property. We will say class equals the name of the class I just invented that I forgot its name already, uh, a wide image with no dot. Why? That's just the way it is. When they were inventing this in 1998, no one had the good idea to say, why don't we keep it consistent? It's class equals wide image with no dot. So on this particular image, we've attached a class within the angle bracket. Be careful there. Don't add it outside. If it does not look red and purple like this, it's outside of the tag and therefore not correct. Right? If it just looks black, it means it's not part of the tag. Class equals white image. Now that we're working with two files, an index HTML file and a CSS file, We've got two files to save. Notice they're both red. Shortcut here. Look at these multiple disks. Save all. Or file, save all, or control, shift s. We need to remember to save all files. So with control, shift s, or clicking that little icon, they all save. All open files save. Open files, not the ones in my folder, the ones that are open. And now if I run Firefox, my image is ignoring me. The image, let me see, did I spell it right? Wide image. Oh, yes. Okay. I did that on purpose because this is to show <laughs> This is to show that it doesn't know what you want unless you tell it exactly what you want. This is what I want. Wide image. Yeah, let me confirm. Wide image. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to save that again. Run that again. There it is. If I expand the screen, the picture gets larger, but it's still only 50% of the viewport. If I, if I stretch it like this, it's going to grow but always 50% of the screen, or shrink. So the two things that we need to do are, we need to attach a class or an ID to a tag with a name, and then we need to define what that rule does. So I've defined the rule right here. Dot white image means with 
of that element 50%. I'm going to put it at 100%, and what that will do is it will display the picture 100% the width of the viewport. So now if I grow it, it'll continue to be taking up that space in the project. It never goes off the edge. So there's that 50%, and then here it is at 100%. It's not 100% of the original size. It's taking up 100% of the space it's been placed into. Right, so uh, if you got that to work, great. Let's take our next break. When we come back, we'll continue to explore a little bit of s more CSS here, specifically with that picture. Um, it's 8 o'clock. Let's take a 10-minute break. When we come back, we will, uh, we will continue. If you need any help, call me over.